Thank you. Uh, Go ahead, Mike. Okay, so we're in Judges chapter 16, and we're going to begin reading in verse 20, and we'll read till the end of the chapter. Judges 16, verse 20, and we're thinking about these journeys of Samson. Uh, we saw he had a journey of lust in verses 1 through 3. We saw he had a journey of love, uh, falling in love with this lady Delilah, verses 4 through 20. And then we're going to be moving in from verse 21 to a journey of loss. So verse 20, it says, and she said, the Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he awoke out of his sleep and said, I will go out as at other times before and shake myself. And he wist not that the Lord was departed from him. But the Philistines took him and put out his eyes and brought him down to Gaza, and bound him with fetters of brass, and he did grind in the prison house. Howbeit the hair of his head began to grow again after he was shaven. Then the lords of the Philistines gathered them together for to offer a great sacrifice unto Dagon their god, and to rejoice. For they said, Our god hath delivered Samson our enemy into our hand and when the people saw him they praised their god for they said our god hath delivered into our hands our enemy and the destroyer of our country which slew many of us and it came to pass when their hearts were merry that they said call for samson that he may make us sport and they called for samson out of the prison house and he made them sport, and they set him between the, the pillars. And Samson said unto the lad that held him by the hand, Suffer me that I may feel the pillars whereupon the house standeth, that I may lean upon them. Now the house was full of men and women, and all the lords of the Philistines were there, and there were upon the roof about three thousand men and women that beheld while Samson made sport. And Samson called unto the Lord and said, O Lord God, remember me, I pray thee, and strengthen me. I pray thee only this once, O God, that I may be at once avenged of the Philistines for my two eyes. And Samson took hold of the two middle pillars upon which the house stood and on which it was borne up of the one with his right hand and the other with his left. And Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. And he bowed himself with all his might. And the house fell upon the lords and upon all the people that were therein. So that the dead which he slew at his death were more than they which he slew in his life. Then his brethren and all the house of his father came down and took him and brought him up and buried him between Zorah and Eshtiol in the burying place of Manoah, his father. And he judged Israel 20 years. And again, God will bless that reading of his precious word to us this morning. <clears throat> we did uh, speak rather hurriedly towards the end of our last study about verse 20. And I thought it's just good to revisit there. This is uh, after... Delilah and her constant uh, pestering him uh, to give the secret of his strength. And finally, he had given her the information that he was a Nazarite to God from his mother's womb. They had shaved his head while he was sleeping. And it says in verse 20, she said, the Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he woke out of his sleep and said, I will go out as at other times before and shake myself. And he wist not that the Lord was departed from him and again one of the the saddest verses i believe in the old testament uh, of uh, somebody who has lost the sense of the presence of god and he wasn't even aware of it uh, he wist not the lord was departed from him and it, it's a very great tragedy it's a it's one of those ichabod moments we saw in first samuel where there the glory of the god of israel had departed from them and we, we see other examples we've mentioned in Scripture where the Spirit departed from Saul. Uh, we saw that in 1 Samuel 16. 
And we, we know that this had such a profound impact on David so that in his penitential prayer, uh, one of the things that he prayed is, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. And of course, we recognize that in the New Testament, there are also examples where the Lord's presence was not there, and it took a while for people to even realize that he was missing. Uh, one example is in the Gospel of Luke, and you'd think that this one would be one where uh, you, you wouldn't expect it, but it's the story where Mary and Joseph, uh, in fact, let's just look at Luke's chap Luke chapter 2. We'll just read these scriptures. Luke chapter 2 and verse 43, it says, and when they had fulfilled the days as they returned, the child Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem, and Joseph and his mother knew not of it. But they, supposing him to have been in the company, went a day's journey, and they sought him among their kinsfolk and acquaintances. And when they found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem, seeking him. And it came to pass that after three days, they found him in the temple. And so here's an occasion where Mary and Joseph, three days without his presence. It took him one day to realize that he wasn't there. And then it took two days to actually finally find him. And so, again, there's another occasion. They knew not that the Lord was not with them. And then, of course, we mentioned last time that the church of Laodicea. Uh, perhaps I, I often wonder, uh, as they went to their gathering uh, <clears throat> in Laodicea, were they saying to one another along the journey, <clears throat> excuse me, where two or three are gathered together, in my name, there am I in the midst. <laughs> and they probably were, felt pretty confident he was. And so they went along with their usual services. And yet the, the Lord Jesus tells us something. He says that, behold, I stand 320 at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. And of course, this is often used in the gospel, but it's really not speaking about the gospel. Here's a church, and the Lord Jesus is outside the door of the church, and he's knocking and trying to get their attention and see if somebody will let him in. And somehow they had shut him out in all their activity uh, in his name, and yet he is no longer the center. He's actually outside the door. And they, for all their frenzied activity, uh, and no doubt there was a lot of noise and a lot of action, but the Lord was not present. Now, of course, we're assured in the New Testament that individually, just as David prayed, take not thy Holy Spirit from me, that actually for a New Testament believer to pray that prayer uh, would be would show a lack of understanding of dispensational truth. And one of the great truths of this dispensation is we have individually the promise that if we're truly born again and where our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit, that he will never, ever leave the child of God. And what a wonderful promise this is. But it tells us in Ephesians 4, verse 30, it says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed until the day of redemption. And so the idea is this, that that seal uh, is a guarantee. We're sealed until the day of redemption. That day of redemption is the rapture. And so uh, he, it, he, we, can, we can grieve him but he's not going to leave us where we, we have that assurance. We're sealed by the spirit till the day of redemption. And he, he's going to be with us. The Lord promised he shall abide with you forever. And so we, we, we're not worried that the Holy Spirit will leave us. But if we grieve him, then there will be a corresponding lack of power in our life and service. Uh, we also know that we can quench him. And uh, we read that in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, uh, where Paul exhorts the saints uh, in the assembly. And again, I believe that this is uh, directed particularly to an assembly, but I think it has application to the individual. He's told, quench not the spirit. And, and the idea is, uh, one translation has this, uh, not to uh, pour water on the spirit's fire. Uh, 
In other words, the Holy Spirit wants to work through us with burning zeal, but as he prompts us to do things, if we refuse, we're quenching him, and we're, as it were, pouring water on, on and, and dampening uh, that fire that the Spirit of God wants to light within every one of us. And so it's true that we can be guilty of both grieving and quenching the Spirit. And the result of that is a subsequent loss of divine power. Uh, because he he is grieved and he is quenched, and uh, his energy is no longer available to work through us. It's it's really directed at working in us to bring us to acknowledge our sin and our repentance. And so instead of that divine energy flowing out through us, reaching out to a, a needy world, bringing refreshment to a barren landscape, the spirit of God's energy is directed in us to convict us and bring us to acknowledge that we've quenched him, to acknowledge that we have grieved him. And so his energy is directed to restoring us to fellowship and communion uh, with the Lord. And it's a very serious thing to lose that power. In fact, <laughs> ironically, this week, obviously, this has been on my mind a lot reading these verses. Uh, I actually dreamt one night that uh, Brother Steve Budd said to me after a message, no power, Mike, no power. <laughs> so uh, obviously, this is on my mind. Uh, like, And again, if there is, wh why? It's because the Spirit of God is being quenched or grieved. And oh, how we need to be increasingly sensitive that we do not grieve or quench our indwelling heavenly guest, uh, that we're sensitive to, to his presence because he's the Holy Spirit. And uh, certainly in terms of grieving him, it's usually in connection with saying things or doing things we ought not to say. Uh, for instance, uh, verse 29, contextually, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good for the use of edifying, they may minister grace to the hearers. So usually it, it, he's grieved when we say things that corrupt the saints rather than build up the saints. And if you've ever said something and you know the minute you said it, you shouldn't have said it. And, and how do you know that? As soon as it's out of your mouth, you wish you could grab it and stick it back in. The reason you know it is because you know the Spirit's being grieved. And then the second thing is, it's to do with uh, verse 31, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away uh, from me with all malice. Be kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. And I think nothing grieves the Spirit more than a spirit of bitterness and unforgiveness among God's people. Because if anybody knows how much we have been forgiven, it is the Spirit of God who first convicted us of our great sinfulness. And so he's saying to us, how, how come you who has been forgiven so much can't forgive this offense of some brother against you that you're, you're harboring it, you're holding it against it? And so these are things that grieve the spirit. And sometimes in our assemblies, one of the reasons we're not seeing blessing is there's conflicts that may have happened years ago, and Christians have never been able to forgive one another. And there's that sense of resentment. Every time you see this person, all you can think of is the incident. And there's that, that lack of forgiveness amongst the people of God. And it really does uh, hinder the work of the spirit so grieving the spirit as we said is really in connection with with speech uh corrupt communication bitterness because bitterness always manifests itself in words that we say or in attitudes that come out of our mouths and then of course uh quenching the spirit is when we should speak and we're not speaking when he prompts us to some action and we we withhold, we we don't, perhaps for fear or whatever, and and he's quenched. He wants to move us to 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 action, and we're we're resisting that. And so these are very important questions. We certainly don't want to be in the condition uh, of Samson, who wist not uh, that the Lord had departed from him. And so let's go back to uh, Judges sixteen, and we look at verse twenty one now. And we'll notice in verse 21, it says, but the Philistines took him and put out his eyes and brought him down to Gaza and bound him with fetters of brass. And he did grind in the prison house. 
And so the first thing we read is they put out his eyes. And of course, this was often done to prisoners in uh, Bible lands. And of course, uh, it was done in different ways. Either his eyes would have been gouged out of the sockets or punctured with some sharp object or burned with a red hot iron. Either way, the result was the same. Permanent blindness of the person caused by his uh, captors, uh, the ones that had uh, taken him captive. And the irony really is that it was Samson's eyes that were the start of all his troubles. If you remember back to the very beginning of our looking at Samson in chapter 14 and verse one, it says, Samson went down to Timnath and saw a woman in Timnath of the daughters of the Philistines. And he came up and told his father and his mother and said, I have seen a woman in Timnath. We see it in chapter 16. Again, the same problem with his eyes. Then went Samson to Gaza and saw there a harlot and went in unto her. And obviously, although his parents had been good at uh, teaching him about his vows and all the rest of it, they probably didn't teach him the chorus that we often sing, be careful little eyes what you see. <laughs> uh, maybe that wasn't part of the repertoire that they taught him. And so his eyes got him into a lot of trouble. And isn't it true with us? The lust of the eyes can get us into a lot of trouble. And so, again, we have to, like Job, make a covenant with our eyes. <laughs> we have to be careful what we look at. And the Lord had a lot to, see, uh, to say about the eyes uh, in his teaching, recognizing that uh, this through the eye gate, that so much uh, sin uh, would come into the lives of God's people. And so in Mark's gospel, chapter 9 and verse 47, he says, and if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out. <laughs> it's better for thee to enter in the kingdom of God with one eye and having two eyes to be cast into hell fire. And again, I think uh, what the Lord is saying is take drastic measures. <laughs> now, uh, there would be a lot of, if we really took this literally, there would be a lot of one-eyed Christians around, or maybe no-eyed Christians. But I, I, I think the application is very clear, isn't it? What the Lord is saying is, if your eyes are going to cause you trouble, you've got to take drastic measures so that you do not see things that are going to defile you and corrupt you. Uh, look at back to Matthew's gospel, and we're going to see, again, some very interesting words from the Savior, very powerful words. In Matthew 6, verse 22, it says, the light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, the whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? So he's telling us that we should have a single eye. And a single eye has one object in view. And what is that one object that should be in view? Well, the writer to the epistle to the Hebrews tells us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. That should be where our eye is directed, to him, to the Lord. And if, if can you imagine if that if our focus was on him and we were constantly focused on the Lord, our, our whole body truly would be full of light, wouldn't it? But he said, if your eye be evil, it was if we're looking at filth and dirt, which the flesh loves and loves to feed on, then our whole body is full of darkness. And so, again, very, very challenging. says they put out his eyes. <laughs> interestingly enough, we see here just an interesting principle. The last judge, because no more judges after Samson. Now the book continues, but this is the last of the deliverers raised up. The last judge ends up with his eyes put out. What about the last king of Judah? 
Well, that was Zedekiah, wasn't it? What happened to him? Well, look at 2 Kings. Just interesting to observe these little patterns in the word of God that are so instructive. 2 Kings and chapter 25. This is the time of the Babylonian captivity. And it says, and they slew the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes and put out the eyes of Zedekiah and bound him with fetters of brass and carried him to Babylon. So the last of the kings of Judah. Now, thankfully, there's one more king of Judah yet to come. <laughs> and he's going to have perfect sight, <laughs> uh, all seeing. But nevertheless, in terms of Israel's history, the last judge ends up blind. The last, having his eyes put out, the last king ends up blinded. And then what about the last church referred to in the book of Revelation? We've already talked about Laodicea. And what was the problem with Laodicea? Well, there are many problems, but one of them tells us in chapter 3, <clears throat> In verse, I believe, 17, because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. How does the last church end up? Blind. And we would say, yeah, nobody had put its eyes out, but it was truly blinded to its real condition. It thought it was great. We're rich and increased with goods and in need of nothing. But it didn't see what the Lord saw. It's true spiritual poverty. And it's kind of a, a challenging thought, really, that um, perhaps many of our assemblies continue on business as usual. But perhaps there's a true blindness to the spiritual condition. We're not seeing blessing in the gospel we're not seeing lives of holiness like we ought to see and yet there's a there's a happiness to continue on in the apathetic ways uh, and uh, just like Laodicea uh, there's this sense of contentment we're doing all right and I suppose when you compare us with the rest of the population but when you compare yourself with the word of God then you see a different story and so certainly Kind of interesting, too. I was thinking about this. I didn't have it in my notes, but I was thinking the last of the patriarchs, <laughs> Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Jacob ended up blind as well. And so it's just kind of a, a little pattern that you see there. And so just a challenge to us. Now, notice as well, please, again, in 16, it says that not only did his, his eyes uh, were put out, but he, he brought him down to Gaza and bound him. So he's now bound. And again, um, this man who started out with such potential for God, and now he is bound by his enemies. And, and again, sin, uh, it's often been said, is blinding, binding, and grinding in its effects on the people of God. And remember, we said that there's, there's, this, there's this kind of circular uh, kind of motion in the book of Judges, these seven cycles that we've gone through. And of course, if you remember back, it was, you know, sin leads to servitude, leads to supplication, leads to salvation. And we, we see in the very same situation here, his sin of Samson had led him to servitude. He's not only bound, he's now grinding. So uh, I, I don't know how you picture this, but I have this idea of this, this grinding stone, these two stones and they're moved around uh, by uh, obviously some kind of a, a stick that he holds onto and he pushes it round and so it's going round and round as he walks around and so I get this idea of this man going around in circles <laughs> and it's interesting isn't it um, that a man with such potential for God but he ends up going around in circles do you remember the wilderness generation Remember, they had such potential too, didn't they? They'd been delivered by 
power and by blood. They'd been brought out of Egypt. And there was just a short journey across to the promised land. And they had such potential. But because of sin, they ended up going around in circles for 40 years, attending funerals of an unbelieving generation. I was working it out. Uh, if I, my calculations are right, there would have been 43 funerals per day throughout the 38 and a half years of the wilderness wanderings to take care of everyone that had gone in. Such potential and yet ended up going around in circles. And we get this circular motion in the book of Judges. And here he is just going around in circles. So blinded and of course, bound. And again, sin is enslaving. Remember the Lord Jesus said that whoever commits sin is the slave of sin. And so here, this man, he's been really enslaved by lust. And you see it kind of pictured tremendously in this grinding scene. However, verse 22 says, how be it the hair of his head began to grow again after he was shaven. Now, of course, it doesn't happen overnight. It's a gradual process, but that hair began to grow. And you would imagine that during this time, as he's blind and he's going around in circles grinding, I suspect he had a lot of time to reflect upon his folly, to think about what brought him here. Why is he in this condition? That repetitive act of, of going around, and it doesn't take a lot of thinking about. So he's got a lot of time to consider his ways. And so as his hair is growing, I believe that Samson is thinking about these things. And I do believe that he becomes a sincere penitent during this time. Of course, repentance is clearly needed. Uh, we need repentance. The letter to the seven churches, five out of seven are called to repentance. And there's a need of repentance in our day and again you can never repent unless you get honest about your condition and of course now he's he's in a position and so penitence time to change your mind about sin and agree with god and forsake the sin that has once enslaved you and yet there's forgiveness with god and that's a wonderful truth of the word of god isn't there that there's forgiveness david we've talked about him already that uh, he was he was forgiven he was genuinely repentant, a broken and contrite spirit that will not despise, O oh God. And so David is forgiven after the sin with Bathsheba <clears throat> uh, and, um, and the death of Uriah the Hittite. However, that forgiveness didn't bring Uriah back. It did not prevent David's children from rebellion. It did not give Samson his eyes back either. His hair grew, there was forgiveness. There's even a measure of usefulness in his death. But sadly, the consequences of sin are there. As we study Samson, we're reminded that sin is very destructive. And again, how thankful we are that the word of God says that if we confess our sin, he, the Lord Jesus, is faithful to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness and yet although forgiveness is immediate restoration to intimacy is more gradual because partly you're dealing with the accuser <laughs> and the accuser is hindering the enjoyment of intimacy he keeps coming and reminding you of your failures and so there's there, there's restoration it's gradual. The hair growth was not immediate, but slow and steady. Old habits must be unlearned. New habits must be learned. There must be a forsaking. And so this hair growing, and perhaps in this process of the hair growing, we, we can't be dogmatic, but perhaps there's a renewal of the Nazarite's vow. Why do I say that? Look back at 13, please. Chapter 13 and verse 7. This is what the Lord said. But he said unto me, Behold, thou shalt conceive and bear a son, and now drink no wine nor strong drink, neither eat any unclean thing. 
for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb to the day of his death, to the day of his death. So perhaps as he goes around, his hair starts to grow again, and he renews that Nazarite vow. His hair grows together with his repentance and his strength with the growth of his hair. Now notice verse 23, it says, Then the lords of the Philistines gathered them together for to offer a great sacrifice unto Dagon, their god, and to rejoice. For they said, Our god hath delivered Samson, our enemy, into our hand. And when the people saw him, they praised their God, and they said, Our God hath delivered into our hands our enemy and the destroyer of our country, which slew many of us. And one of the great tragedies when a servant of God falls into sin is that he causes the enemy great occasion to blaspheme. And that's exactly what we see here. That's exactly what happened with David. If we remember 2 Samuel, let me just read the scripture in chapter 12 and verse 14. And of course, the world loves this. Some servant of God has fallen. It's in the headlines. Everybody knows about it. And it says, how be it, verse 14 of 2 Samuel 12, because by this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. The child also that is born of thee shall surely die. And that's one of the great tragedies, isn't it, of sin. Any servant of the Lord uh, to, to fall into sin. And of course, we're all servants. That's not, I'm not putting anybody uh, ahead of anyone else. Uh, people are watching us. People are looking uh, to justify their rebellion and their sin against God. And if we... Uh, are involved in these kind of things, then once again, we have this opportunity of uh, giving the enemy occasion to blaspheme. And so they said, our God hath delivered Samson, our enemy, into our hand. Say it twice. Our God hath delivered into our hands, our enemy, and the destroyer of our country, which slew many of us. Two things here. First of all, they call it their country, but it wasn't given to them. It was given to the people of God. It was actually given to the tribe of Dan. It wasn't their country. It was the Lord's, and he had given it to Israel. But they said he has de destroyed our country. And, of course, we referring to him burning their, their, their crops, their, their fields. And then he slew many of us. So they're acknowledging the damage Samson had done. Remember, the Lord in his sovereignty had said that he sought occasion against the Philistines, and he was going to use Samson. And Samson had had a measure of success in not only destroying their produce of their land, but also slaying many of them. Notice verse 25. It came to pass when their hearts were merry that they said, call for Samson that he may make a sport. And they called for Samson out of the prison house, and he made them sport, and they set him between the pillars. So there's an opportunity now. They've, they've obviously, Samson has made a mockery of them and uh, destroyed many of them, but now it's their chance at payback, and they want to make sport with him. And again, I, I can't help but think of the parallels. We've talked about some of the foreshadowings of the Lord Jesus, a greater deliverer than Samson. And yet, remember, Samson was betrayed for silver. Do you remember uh, she betrayed him, a, a, somebody who he felt was a close intimate. He loved this woman. And so somebody close betrayed him. And as a result of that betrayal, his enemies mocked him and made sport of him. And of course, the Lord Jesus betrayed by his own familiar friend, 30 pieces of silver. And then he's brought before the soldiers, before the crowds mocking him, even in the cross, they're jeering and taunting him. And so we see this faint foreshadowing again of the Lord Jesus Christ in these things. And so they 
mock him. But he says in verse 25, of course, as they call him uh, and they make sport of him, it says, verse 26, and Samson said to the lad that held him by the hand, suffer me that I may feel the pillars whereupon the house standeth that I may lean upon them. Again, this, this man, this, this man who has had such supernatural strength needs a little lad to lead him by the hand now. He's so uh, incapacitated, he's so blind, but he wants to know where the pillars are that are holding up this structure. And so the lad shows him and he leans upon them. And then it tells us that there was quite, there was quite a, a crowd had come to make sport of Samson, just like there would have been at the Passover around Calvary. Such a crowd would have been there jeering the Savior, mocking him. And it says in verse 27, now the house was full of men and women, and all the lords of the Philistines were there. And there were upon the roof about 3,000 men and women that beheld while Samson made sport. And I don't know, I get this picture of a maybe a, a courtyard uh, with roof on it, and then a central area in the temple where the pillars were that held up these porticos. And you get the picture of him, uh, all these people glaring at him, mocking him, all the rest of it. And, and so it, we read in verse 28 that Samson called unto the Lord. That's why I said, I believe that there's something going on during that time that his hair is growing back. There's something happening to this man as he has time to meditate, time to think, time to repent of his folly and his foolishness. It says, Samson called unto the Lord and said, O oh Lord God, remember me, I pray thee, and strengthen me. Somebody else said to the Lord Jesus, didn't they? Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. Lord, remember me, I pray thee. And then he says, strengthen me, I pray thee, only this once. O God, that I may be at once avenged of the Philistines for my two eyes. Now, again, we've said that so much of what Samson does, it's always about him. <laughs> it's about him getting even. It's about him taking vengeance against his enemies. And you would have loved to have seen here at the end, Lord, give me victory over your enemies. But no, it's my enemies, really. And, uh, and may I be avenged from my eyes. And yet, nevertheless, God, we said in his sovereignty, we, we've got to keep going back to chapter 14, where God saw occasion against the Philistines. And he's using him to begin to deliver Israel. And so the, he, he cries out in prayer to the Lord. And it's a wonderful thing uh, that even in our impoverished state, when we cry out to the Lord in sincerity, the Lord hears us. Here's a man. He's not in, uh, you know, he's in a terrible state because of his own sin, but he calls to the Lord uh, in his repentance and brokenness, and the Lord hears him. And so he says, oh, God, that I may once avenge. And Samson took hold of the two middle pillars upon which the house stood and on which it was borne up of the one with his right hand and the other with his left. And Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. And he bowed himself with all his might. And the house fell upon the lords and upon all the people that were therein. So the dead which he slew at his death were more than they which he slew in his life. And we might say that Samson accomplished more through his death than he did through his life. Does that remind you of another faint foreshadowing of a greater deliverer? See, the Lord's perfect life, which is wonderful. We love the meal offering. We love observing the perfections of the person of the Lord Jesus. But his perfect life could not save us. It was his death and the shedding of his precious blood that could save us. And so we could say more was accomplished through the death of Christ. And I believe eternity will be telling that story of all that was accomplished through the death of the Lord Jesus <laughs> in, the, in the ages upon ages. This great company surrounding the throne, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, will be forever praising him for his sacrificial death. And so the Lord accomplished more through his death 
and through his life. Now, his perfect life was essential to the effectiveness of that death because he had to be a lamb without blemish. But that perfect life couldn't save. He had to die. And so what a wonderful thing that the Lord Jesus in his death brought forth more glory to God than he did in his life and so did samson and so <clears throat> again we see if there's only if there's three thousand men and women on the roof uh, we don't know what the total number is but obviously inside there was a big number too and so there was a great company that were ended up perishing amongst the philistines the lord began as it were to deliver israel through this man and so <clears throat> it says in verse 31 then his brethren and all the house of his father came down and took him and brought him up and buried him between Zorah and Eshtiol in the burying place of Manoah, his father. And he judged Israel 20 years. So we end up really where we began with Samson's story. Because if you look back at chapter 13, chapter 13 in verse 25, it says, the spirit of the Lord began to move him at times in the camp of Dan between Zorah and Eshtiol. And now we're well, once again, this man is being buried between Zorah and Eshtiol, buried in the place where the spirit of God first began to move on this man. And it says it was buried in the burying place of Manoah, his father. And so it would seem to imply that they <clears throat> were buried, um, would, be, would be laid in the same place, the father and the son. And although his father is still alive at this time, it says, brethren, all his house, or, or maybe not, all the house of his father came down and took him. Maybe he's already dead. Maybe he died of a broken heart because of Samson's waywardness. We're not sure, but they're buried together. And we have that final story. He judged Israel 20 years. And so how do we kind of conclude Samson's story? Well, what's interesting about Samson's story, is not only is it highly entertaining, I mean, of all the Bible characters that we said last time, he's a Sunday school story classic because he's such an interesting character and such an interesting events. So there's a great entertainment but I want to suggest to you that Samson, the last judge, was intended as a mirror for Israel. In Samson, Israel was to see herself. Just like when the Lord told the story of the prodigal son, he wanted the Pharisees to see themselves in the other son. Right, there was an intention in the story. He wanted him to see something. Well, I believe that in this true story of Samson, the Lord wants Israel to see a kind of a paradigm of themselves, a picture of themselves. One raised up out of nothing, richly gifted, who panders around with other lovers, and yet always expects Jehovah to come through for them whenever they're in trouble. Isn't that a picture of Israel? taken <laughs> out of nothing, richly gifted by God, blessed immeasurably by God, and yet constantly running after other loves, and yet always expecting the Lord to come through on their behalf. And Israel had received grace upon grace throughout their story. And yet, here's a man who has seen the Lord come through for him over and over again. And yet he still assumes that all is well, doesn't realize the Lord has departed from him, that Ichabod <laughs> had happened to him. And of course, it's also a little picture, isn't it, about the church. So blessed by God, brought from nothing. I mean, who are we? Weak and foolish things, saved out of sin and degradation, raised to incredible heights. And yet, just like Samson, we're constantly wandering. Prone to wander, oft I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. 
running after other things, things that we know can't satisfy broken systems, but yet they still have an appeal to us. And sometimes we're not honest about our true condition. But yet, as we kind of conclude, this it began with a journey of lust, if you remember this chapter. And Samson, at the end of this journey of lust, he carries the gates of Gaza away with him. This last section, you have a journey of loss. And instead of him carrying the gates away, they carry him away <laughs> and they take him to his burial place. And yet, Samson destroyed the gates of Gaza on that journey of lust, and Samson destroys the temple at Gaza in this journey of loss. <laughs> and so, remember, the Lord says that through him, I'm going to begin to deliver Israel. Well, this is quite a blow, isn't it? The gates of one of its five major cities have already been destroyed by Samson, and now its temple has been destroyed by Samson. And so what a fitting way to kind of end this little section before we, uh, we dip our feet into chapter 17. And so just an amazing story, and yet one that's a challenge to all of us. Uh, and again, we might say this in conclusion, that James 1.15, we've said it again and again, but sin, when it's finished, brings forth death. That is illustrated so clearly in the life of Samson. Sin, when it's finished, brings forth death. It's true in David's life. Sin at the beginning. It always looks attractive. I'm sure that all these women that caught Samson's eyes were beautiful women. But sin, when it's finished, brings forth death. Bathsheba, no doubt a very beautiful woman. But sin, when it's finished, death is visited again and again and again as a result of that incident. And then, as we've been reminded, ultimately, all sin, when it's finished, brought forth death in the person of the Lord Jesus. You see, if you want to see sin when it's finished, we have to look at Calvary. That's where my sin ended up. That's where the sin of the world was judged. You see, sin when it's finished brings forth death. And yet, <clears throat> we're thankful that the Lord Jesus conquered death and that he came forth victorious from the grave and now lives in the power of an endless life. And he is death's great conqueror. Now, we just have a few minutes. I just want to make a few introductory remarks to chapter 17. We're going to get there next time. We don't want to take anything away from our previous uh, section. But what we want to see is that we're actually done with the judges. They, we saw them really from chapter 3 through chapter 16. So as we think of the outline, we had in chapters one and two, uh, we had our beginning. I like Wisby's outline. He says it was a time of apathy. Uh, initially, they started well, but inertia set in. And instead of driving out the Canaanites, they, they allowed them to settle amongst them. They became apathetic. They became comfortable. And so a time of apathy. And then that led to a time of apostasy when they turned away from the Lord in the period of the judges. And yet God would, you know, when they go through these cycles, they cry out, God would raise up a deliverer for them. And now this final section, 17 through 21, is a time of deep anarchy. Everyone is doing that which is right in his own eyes. We're going to see that mantra repeated again and again in this final section in 17 through 21. And so we're going to see a tremendous time of great apathy uh, or anarchy. It began with apathy. It led to apostasy. It resulted in anarchy. And we might just say this, that I think that the greatest problem with the church of the Lord Jesus in our day is apathy. It's apathy. And Judges tells us, Look where apathy takes you. <laughs> Look at the journey from apathy to apostasy to anarchy. That's the journey it takes you on. And somehow 
we have to wake up out of our apathetic, apathetic state and really, again, repent and do the first works. <laughs> Renew our love relationship with the Lord Jesus. Renew a zeal for the things that he has a zeal for. A lost and dying world, the gospel, the, 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 the house of God, uh, zeal for prayer, zeal for holiness. These things have to captivate us because we're on a very dangerous trajectory at this moment in time. May God encourage us, challenge us, and stir us uh, with the lessons from the life of Samson and the bigger lessons from the book of Judges. Amen.